Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. And we get the back view of him. And I mean, it's just a mega. 52 yards is a long shot. Uh, Magnum P.I. is what yeah. we named him. No idea. Just what. a magnum. Yeah, just a magnum. Come on, Cam, last year we, we said probably 150, mid-150. Yeah. Same Doe from the morning come out with that nine-pointer. Here, here steps out this 90-inch eight point. You're like, <laughs> yeah. ah. I'm like, okay, well, there's still a buck back there grunting. Yeah. And then I'll step like another 90-inch eight-pointer. Yeah. I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Bro, yeah, bro. Yeah. You're like, I'm like, deer right there. Yeah, like, and he's 30 already yards. 30 yards. Yeah, he he was literally five yards from the base of the tree. Could have been had a buck down at 1:40 in the afternoon, back there deep on public. Three does come out pretty early. It was like 2:45, 24 yard shot. Sent the combat veteran, and I tell you what, man, dude, it just smoked. We always get so jacked up when the other person kills. It's just almost like we got it done. Yeah. And when you kill that doe, I was like, hell yeah, man. And we come down here to Missouri. My ass called me one more time. I'm like, is it a good buck? And he goes, yeah, real good, solid buck. I'm like, all right, boom. <laughs> and the deer just drops for sure. Super special to me. Whitetail Legacy Podcast, bringing you back to the hunt. And leaving a legacy. Baller rut. Oh, did you oh, start it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, send it. Uh, this is the uh, Whitetail Legacy <laughs> podcast uh, coming in your ear holes. A little delayed at the start. Still don't know how to do this. Um, <laughs> it's gonna start out be like, uh, is this thing? Is this thing on? I got no snare in my headphones. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, where's the snare? Yeah, where's the snare? <laughs> got nothing. Um, all right, we got a legends coming at you. A legend of the wood coming out of Pennsylvania. You don't hear a lot of big deer coming out of Pennsylvania. And when we started this, we wanted to try to hit every state possible, and we had Wayne Gadley from Tine Tales come on um, and tell the story of this buck they chased on public forever and was finally successful. Pretty awesome story. Uh, you guys are really going to enjoy this. Let's get into the people that make this possible, and we'll get into the show. You got the VIP. Yeah, VIP among everything going on, guys. VIP is still going strong. Um, they've got the combat veteran available for everybody. And if you do buy it... Um, Purchase a pack of broadheads right now. When the 440C blades are available, they will uh, ship that to you when they are available at no extra charge. So don't be afraid to get your order in, and uh, y- your broadhead will be up to snuff right before deer season. So um, Yeah, I mean, the the the, the broadheads that they have now, the blades that they have now is the like industry standard blade. Exactly, yeah. You know, and, and Matt's going above and beyond with the 440C and... You have to wait for this stuff. There's, I think, there's only one guy in the United States that's doing it right now, and he's pretty backed up. I know, so it's pretty incredible. If you wanted to get the combat veteran, um, we shot it with the uh, other blades all last year and had no problems with it at all. And uh, homie shot it through a deer; it's still ready to rock and roll. So, yep. um, it's nothing, nothing that's going to be any different than any other broadhead that you have on the market, other than you're going to be able to get a better blade that's going to last longer, stay sharper longer in the end when they send you it and it's real simple to change the blades out. So that's another great offer that VIP is giving out. You got the VIP veteran shout out. Yeah. This week's shout out is uh, pretty special to me. Um, I've been talking with Matt a lot uh, through Facebook messenger. So this week's shout out is uh, Matt Talkington. He was in the U S army imagery stationed at Schofield barracks in Hawaii. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, he served in the 2-35 Image Infantry Battalion, uh, 3rd Brigade, Brigade uh, Combat Team. He was in the 25th Infantry Division, uh, one tour in Afghanistan from 2011 to 2012 in the Peck River Valley, located in the Kinar Province. Uh, was also a COP Honaker Miracle and the... Uh, oh, man... Nan, oh, Nan Glam, yeah, Nan, Nan Glam, yeah, base. Nan Glam. There you go, yeah. Nan Glam, uh, base while he was there. So, uh, Matt, we appreciate your service, and um, I, I can't wait to, you know, I'm looking forward to making a better friendship with you, 
and uh, appreciate your sacrifice and everything you went through um, during your time there in the U.S. Army. Yeah, man. Appreciate you going over to Afghanistan, Iraq, man. That's some serious stuff. So appreciate your time you spent over there. Appreciate, you know, just doing doing the duty that a lot of people don't do in this nation to, to keep everybody else safe and uh, let us do this podcast and continue on living our normal freedom life. You yeah. know what I mean? So let's get into ECW hunting calls, all your custom call needs. If you want anything engraved on a call, if you want your name, if you want a turkey feather, if you want a spur, if you want anything, any picture, he can engrave it. He nailed our logo, and our logo is pretty detailed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and he crushed it on uh, like a two by two or two by three. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. small to two get that three, detail. Yeah. So he does an awesome job with that right there. So if you want anything custom on a turkey call, um, he's your guy. Ingram's outdoor obsession. Um, with everything going on, Ingram's still working. Um, just going to have to wait to pick up your bucks for anyone local. Um, Ingram's wife works in the medical field. Um, we, with this podcast, we know there's a bunch of stuff going on. Everybody knows <laughs> about it. Um, and every, that's all you hear about is that I listen to a lot of other hunting podcasts, and that's what everybody's talking about. So we have made it a point to not bring up what's going on. Everybody knows it's already going on, and we want to talk about deer hunting and not some freaking virus going around. But <laughs> for all the local guys listening to Ingram, he's doing the right thing. He's still mounting the bucks, but he's not going to let anybody pick him up from the shop. You can call him, and he can set up an arrangement for you to pick it up remotely. Um, and that's what he's going to be doing. I think that's a smart move for him. He's trying to do the best thing for him's family and also the best thing for you um, to protect you right now. And I, I bet you the interchange right there, the six-foot interchange is going to be like, here's your buck, come get it, <laughs> drop off the money, walk up, pick the money, all right, sign this, walk away. <laughs> it's going to be pretty epic. So, But we know what's going on. I know you're probably like, oh, they're going to be talking about it on here, but uh, we know what's going on, and we just decided – the last few weeks to not not talk about it you know what i mean that's that's the way of us doing it um i think it's the right thing to do everybody else is hearing enough about about it so exodus trail cams um what you got yeah now is the absolute perfect time to update your any software or firmware you guys need to update on any of the trail cams that you guys have um whether that's exodus brand or not but um that's something that you know the guys from Exodus have pointed out to us in the last couple of years that we've uh, really been running their cameras hardcore is, uh, you know, each year there's improvements made to the software on each camera. And now is literally the perfect time to do it because you're not really relying on that camera to be out there in the field, you know, giving you important data as, as if you were, you know, in September. So, um, whether you d have that cam out in the field or whether you have it in, in storage, um, right now is a perfect time to get it hooked up to a computer and get some new um, firmware on it because the new stuff does come out. Yeah, I mean, they uh, they have a, couple, a video and a, a write-up about how to do this. Super simple. Um, and it's, it's the best thing you can do to make sure that camera is going to work its best. It's just like your phone update, you know. It feels like your phone updates every two weeks, you know what I mean? I don't even know. It's like 13.92 now on <laughs> yeah, iPhone, right. you know what I mean? So it's the same thing, man. These cameras, they get updated, the firmware changes, and uh, a lot of times if you go through too many firmware changes, the camera isn't going to be up to spec of what it should be and can be. And with a five-year warranty, you know there's going to be multiple of these coming on. So Yeah, and this is going to – if you call with a question, this is going to be the first thing that they ask you is what firmware is on that camera. Yeah. And you're going to have to – you're going to have to, you know, give them the answer. You're going to have to look at your cam and look at the answer and uh, give it to them and, you know – most that's likely that's going to solve yeah. your, solve your SD issue. SD card problem or a picture problem or anything that's going to solve your issues, just updating. Even it, even like if, if you're trying to, it's not right into the card and then you put it in your computer and there's no pictures on it, a lot of times that firmware is not writing correctly. So yep. um, that's one thing that we want to shout out. Um, like I said, check out Trail Cam Radio and Whitetail Cribs doing awesome stuff. Um, Next Level Deer Supplements. Yeah, be, you know, this is the time. Um, does are very pregnant right now, so this is the time to be getting them a step ahead and they're getting like, them everything that they like need. They're like going to get 
McFlur- going to McFlurries and Blizzards <laughs> yeah, for pregnant, sure. right? You know like, I mean? This, I mean, this is critical time. So yeah. um, don't wait any more time to start getting the deer the nutrition that they need. And the one-stop shop for all that is nextlevedeer.com. Yeah, check them out. You can message them there or Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. These guys will respond to you. Any questions you have about nutrients, what's in the mineral, what's in their feed, what you should be doing, how you should be feeding it, they will answer you guys. This is a company that will get back with you and uh, will do the right thing. So check out Next Level Deer Supplements. All right, let's get in the show. All right, we got Wayne Gadley on the line. Um, We appreciate you coming on, man. How you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing good. I'm uh, excited to hear the story of this brow time buck. You've been out there in Pennsylvania getting it done, getting it done on some Ohio bucks, having some really good success the last few years. So uh, um, really excited to, to hear this story. Uh, go ahead and give the listeners a little introduction of who you are and what you do. Yeah, so uh, my name is Wayne Gadley, as you guys just uh, stated there. But uh, uh, by trade, I'm a forester, so... I spend a lot of time in the woods, which actually helps me out when it comes to deer hunting. Um, But basically, I've lived in northwest Pennsylvania forever. Um, I grew up here, and uh, growing up, uh, we hunted all public land, which I still hunt public to this day. Um, So I guess I could technically say that I have hunted public since before it was a cool thing to do. But... uh, we did what we had to do and that's what we had. So, um, we just kind of, we rolled with it and we, we made the best out of what we had. So, uh, I just a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in a small community and my graduating class from high school actually had 22 kids in it. And this is a private, or I mean, not, it's, it's not a private school. This is a public school. So, you know, a lot of guys are like, Oh yeah, I went to a small school and I have a hundred <laughs> kids in my class and, I'm like, well, I had 22 and they're like, what, you know? So it's, uh, I'm, I'm no stranger to being in, in the middle of nowhere, basically. And, uh, that's where I grew up at. That's where I still live and probably where I'll die at too. So, um, but, uh, so, so the town that I grew up in is actually situated in, uh, I call it Northwest Pennsylvania but it's on the Allegheny Plateau. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that at all or not. No, or, no. Uh, it's, so basically, it's it's a region in uh, northwest Pennsylvania that is kind of higher elevation than the rest with less rolling. I mean, we still have hills. We still have topography, but it's less intense than like the eastern part of the state. Um, so it's called the Allegheny Plateau. And uh, the town I grew up in, is at the beginning of the national forest and uh pennsylvania only has one national forest i didn't know if you guys knew that or not most guys don't know but there's only one actual national forest in the state Hmm. and uh it's 550,000 acres of land which is huge (laughs) you know so you can you can from my house you can drive a couple hours and you're still in national forest now there's you know, a piece of private here, a piece of private there. But for the most part, it's as remote as you can get. You know, a lot of guys from Allegheny County and down south by uh, Pittsburgh, they have camps up my way and they'll come up to what they call, you know, to the forest. And, uh, you know, so that's sort of where I grew up at to give you guys kind of a, I'm not going to name the town here because it's a small town and I don't know if I want everyone here <laughs> to know exactly where that's at. But yeah, it's, I don't, I don't it's, blame you it, there. It's on the edge of National Forest. Um, and like I said, it's pretty much the gateway to 550,000 acres of public land hunting, which is not bad if you know where to go. Um, Man, 550,000 acres. There's got to be that's something That's just intimidating as hell just to think yeah. about. I'm just like, I'm sitting here like, holy shit. I'd be so lost, man. I don't even know where to start. You know what I mean? Like, in there's there's no ag. There's if you get down southern, I actually live uh, 20 minutes south of that now. Um, I live in Clarion County, and I grew up in Forest County. And uh, in Clarion County, we have some ag, so there are. It's it's still different than hunting in the Midwest where you guys are at in Illinois. It's uh, 
but it's more similar because there are more fields, there's more farmland, but there's still more woods than there are, you know, farms. Um, but where I grew up in Forest County, we actually don't even have a stoplight in the county. So that's, I think it's the only county in Pennsylvania that does not have a stoplight. It's kind of another random factor, wow. but, wow. you know, like I said, that just kind of goes to show you that it's just, a, it's honestly a different place than what most people are used to, you know, um, but I could, I mean, when I was a kid, I could walk out my back door and you're literally on public land. And I, I took it for granted because I never really thought about it. It just was, you, you grew up and, you know, you want to go hunting. You just walk out your back door or ride your bicycle and you can, you can hunt. Um, and uh, so basically that's kind of different for most people because most people don't have that option. They, you know, they, ha- they grew up on a family farm and they hunt that or, you know, they drive an hour, two hours to go hunt somewhere. And I literally could do it out my back door. And I grew up with that. And I never really understood how much that actually meant to me until I, I got older, you know. Yeah, man, just having yeah. that option just to go right out the back door. I had that growing up, too. And I miss it, man. It wasn't near as much as that. But <clears throat> I always joked I could I could walk, you know, three, four miles and still be on public in a straight line you know there's so much ground and public wasn't cool like you said so you never nope. you you might see like one random dude out there during muzzleloader season or something <laughs> you know what i mean like it is just, just yours you know and like then everybody down there since the there wasn't a lot of people hunting on the public all the private ground mm-hmm. that was like in between the public they were like oh yeah you can hunt it you know because no one was really into it so i was just like Pfft. I'm crossing fences. I'm like, yeah, I got a permission here. I got permission here. I don't know where to go. You know, <laughs> I just set well, a, I just set a lot of places where I could see the most, cover the most ground with my eyes. That was my go-to tactic, which was the complete opposite dude, of yeah, probably what I so should have had. Yeah, yeah. That's probably why I didn't well, kill anything forever. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know that could be. <laughs> but a, a lot of guys always thought that this this private, you know, you have this 550 thousand acres of public. And then you have a 50 acre piece of private and everyone always thought that that 50 acres is the place to be because nobody else can be on it. So literally you have, you know, 15 guys surrounding the property because they're like, Oh, this big bucks stay on this piece of property. <laughs> that, that was, that was the mentality, you know, growing up. That's what guys, that's, that was my mentality on private land was it held big deer and public didn't have anything, you know, which is not true at all. <laughs> you know, I, I, I found that out obviously but um it's just uh it's 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 definitely a different world um and i don't know if you guys know much about pennsylvania and how um our hunting regulations and what that kind of stuff uh leads to i guess or yeah, very very it, it seldom, but to. i've seen a lot of posts on social media about it that's about the only thing i learned you know learned from on the well we we started in i think it was 2002 or, or two, maybe 2000. Don't quote me on that because I, I was 12 years old in 2002. So I was born in 1990. Um, so it was either 2000 or 2002, somewhere in that ballpark. I, I, I didn't look it up. I don't know the facts on it, but um, we started uh, an antler restriction in Pennsylvania, um, which in, in the area that I live, it was three points to a side. So basically you had to have it didn't matter if it, if they were three on the beam, as long as there was three legal points on that side of the deer, then that was a legal deer. Um, now, if you get down south below Interstate 80, there's I think it's three up on a beam. So you, it doesn't matter if it has a brow time, but it has to have three on the beam, which is kind of, in my opinion, that's that's a stupider rule. I'd rather just have the three on the side. But maybe that's because that's what I grew up with. Um but since they started that, they implemented that in the early 2000s, our, the, the quality of our deer in Pennsylvania has definitely changed dramatically. You know, the, the age class of our deer has gone from a year and a half to two and a half year old bucks to where you actually starting to get a mature deer now. You know, they're, they're far and few between, but there's definitely a lot more four or five year old deer than what there used to be. And I mean, QDMA, I, I think right there is, that's a good reason for it, you know? So 
I know I know when it first was, was introduced, everyone was like, oh, what are you doing? Why do you why are you you're going to ruin the state? Because guys just want to come to camp and they just want to hang out and drink beer and shoot a deer. And that, which is what a lot of guys want to do. They don't care about the size. You know, they didn't care about the size of the rack. They just wanted to go to camp, hang out with their buddies. And they want to just shoot the first deer that comes by. And if it's a spike or a four point point, you know, they didn't really care. And so it's kind of changed. It honestly has changed the way that people hunt because of the quality of our deer um which is kind of interesting because i've i've grew i've grown up and actually seen how much has changed you know i i'm hitting uh i don't know if you want to call it the curve but i'm hitting this at the right time because you know m- when my dad grew up if someone shot an eight point they were talking down and you know it might have been a 12 inch wide eight point but it was like oh this dude shot an eight point you know because there weren't old deer, you know, just because that's, there was no quality control on, on, and everyone just shot the first legal animal that came by, whether it was a doe or a buck or whatever, they just, they shot it, you know? Um, so that's kind of, in my opinion, Pennsylvania is definitely changing for the better. Um, but it's still, we're, we're way behind you guys. <laughs> we're, we're way behind states like Ohio or Illinois on quality of deer and, you know, so we, we still can't hunt Sundays, so. What's that tell you? Yeah, I know that's insane. But you guys are but, working on it, though. Yeah, they're they're talking about it, but the problem is, in my opinion, with that, like the, the last year was a big change too, because the first for forever as long as I can remember, our rifle season in Pennsylvania came in on a Monday, and now that rifle season comes in on Saturday. They made a big change, which is that's a huge change for us. And this year they want to make it so you can hunt like. Uh, the first Sunday of rifle season, they're going to make, I think three Sundays per or three Sundays a year you can hunt, which is also super confusing. But the first Sunday they want to introduce that is in rifle season. So you're going to have the first Saturday rifle season, and then you're going to have Sunday to hunt. And I think the guys are just going to completely annihilate our deer population. You know, and in our, our, our rifle season is two weeks long. So you can hunt with a high power rifle for two weeks. And two full weekends, which is, to me, is crazy. You know, you, you guys have what, like a second, or you, you, you guys have muzzleloader, like a first muzzleloader, and then a second muzzleloader, something like that? We have a first shotgun, which is three days, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which is always the weekend before Thanksgiving. And then we'll have Thanksgiving weekend, and then the weekend after, we'll also have a, a, our second shotgun season is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then the weekend after that is the muzzleloader handgun um, season. Okay. So you don't have really that much time, and it's, it's shotgun only just because of, I guess, how flat yeah, the state is. Yeah, we got a is, week. We got a reasoning. week. Yeah, a week is, or 10 days if you have a muzzleloader. Yeah, if you have a muzzleloader, okay. you have 10 days. But I don't think you can hunt with a muzzleloader first season, can you? Nope. Second yeah. season only for muzzleloader. Right. Shotgun. First okay. season is shotgun specific. Second season is muzzleloader. Um, and shotgun. And shotgun. Then there's a muzzleloader season. Right. Which okay. is confusing. See, we, but. <laughs> yeah. So we, we have what, so we have six weeks of archery, and then we have two weeks of rifle season. And archery starts usually around the 1st of October and goes to, like, November 14th, November 18th, depending on how it falls that year. So basically, when, when the hunting starts to get good, our archery season's over. You know? Yeah. And then we, we have... They like late season after Christmas, we have three weeks of either archery or primitive, which is like black powder, you know, for like so flip locks and stuff like that. But I just rifle hunter, like that two weeks of rifles really it's 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 hard on our deer population, you know. Yeah, what was it sure. in what is it in Missouri? I think it's two weeks. It's too. two weeks, yeah. Two weeks so straight. so my this past year was my first chance to go to Missouri and experience that. And uh, Cody's grandpa lives up on this hill, and I was like, dude, if I lived here and, you know, you had two weeks, you could literally just go out there, sit on the hill with a with a super high-end rifle and probably shoot the deer that you wanted to shoot every year w- with two weeks. You just come home, 3 o'clock, sit out there till dark, and, I mean, you probably get it done. You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, so it is, it is mind-blowing that you know, how long you can hunt with a gun, but when the population is doing what the state wants it to do, you know, they're the, the dictators of what's going on. Missouri deer population is way higher than ours. 
per acre, per, per square mile, whatever. Yeah, per capita or yeah. however they want to word it. So it is it is way higher, so that's why they have um, – I just don't know why Missouri don't have a rifle season. I'm kind of glad they don't. I don't really – it doesn't really matter. Like a shotgun, 100 yards is – that's a long ways for us. Some yeah. people, yeah. Some people it's further, but, you know, a rifle, I'm pretty comfortable at 250, 300 um, – this year and I that's killed just one with at your, 60, you know I'm what I mean? Saying, that's but, just with your rifle. There's rifles, you know, you shoot yeah. over five, you know. You have five, six hundred yards, you know, no problem. But right. people kill yeah, an they, antelope they, that far all the time. Exactly. So. <laughs> well, here where I live, you can't see. Most places in the woods, you can only see about 75 to 100 yards. Um, it's really thick. Um, we have a, a lot of beach brush, which I don't know if you guys have that much out there. Um, but our beach brush is just... It's we're, especially where I hunt at is uh, thick to say the least. You know, it, with a bow, if you can see thirty or forty yards a lot of times from a tree stand, that's that's a pretty good spot that you can see from. You know, it's just it's it's hard to see, um, which is the reason why we're getting. It's another reason why we're getting decent deer because even with a rifle, if you're not, I mean, if that deer sees you before you see them, they're gone. You know, so that's kind of a saving grace. Yeah, for in my sure, opinion, yeah. on on that, you know, um, but that's, I think them, that's why why big, we have a two week season too. So yeah, not having them big open ag fields and stuff to to those places here, you could shoot a quarter mile. You know, what I mean, like there's <laughs> nothing there besides ag. Right. Um, yeah. And if a guy could drive down the road and then hop out in the cornfield and poke something at 600 yards, that there'd be a lot more deer that got killed. Getting within 100 yards of anything, I mean. It's tough, you know. A little, it's a lot tougher than six hundred yards, you know. what I mean, so oh, for sure, for sure. But uh, we we had you on, and I'm glad I'm glad that you messaged in because we were doing this legend series, you know, and we started this a while back, and we didn't know how long we were gonna do it. But everybody just loves the legends episodes, you know. And our main goal was, you know, normal guys, n- not anyone famous in the hunting industry that no one knows about that just kill these giant deer just to motivate people that are out there trying to do that that it is possible um it isn't some you know unicorn out there people do get it done you know i mean and we wanted to get you know a lot of different states involved and we we've have done that but you know a lot of the giants come from ohio missouri iowa illinois um kentucky you know so it's cool that we did have the one from Arkansas, though. That was a sleeper. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. cool that we get to get sure. Pennsylvania now. So, uh, you know, you want to? You asked me, you know, this this might be kind of what you guys are in. I don't know. And I'm like, 100%, we want you on. We want to give Pennsylvania a voice. So that's what you're doing now, man. You're giving Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania a legendary buck voice. Um, and we're going to talk about the Browtine buck. Um, I've only got to see one trail cam or – uh, video. I don't know if you. It wasn't a trail cam, was it? It's just yeah. It's a trail cam video. Was it? it was. It was a trail cam video that I videoed through my computer screen on my phone. So nice. <laughs> that's yeah. not the best quality of photo for you. Definitely but. a uh, giant Pennsylvania buck for sure, and an old <clears throat> legend. We had one on here. How? What it score? Eighty five. What did Oscar score? <laughs> oh, but anyways, man. it was it was this old. You know, it was like eight and a half, and I know this was an old deer too. So um, just kind of. I'm really excited to hear the story. Kind of go into it um, wherever you want to start and, and tell us the story of the Brow Time Buck. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I just really appreciate you guys honestly having me on the show here. So, um, but this, so this, this deer, um, actually the story of this deer started in the year 2009, the spring of 2009. Um, and the fin- uh, we, we found uh, a shed off of this buck which was the right side. And the year we found the shed, we assumed that he was a two and a half year old deer, maybe a three and a half. We're not a hundred percent sure. Just going by the size of the antler um, in Pennsylvania, it was a, uh, he, he was a really good buck. It, you know, as my, as my dad would say, he was a cracker jack um, when he was two and a half. And I mean, immediately it was like, this is the deer we got to kill. We, we got to get on this deer and kill it. And, uh, so this was kind of in 2009. I was I don't even know how old I was. That was my first year in college. I see I would have been a sophomore in college. Um, so I wasn't home a lot. I was in school about two hours away from home, but I was home as much as I could. 
Um, so I actually was not with my dad when he found the shed, uh, but he found the the right hand side of this deer underneath a hemlock tree. And, uh, you know, he showed it to me and I'm like, we, we got to get on this deer. This, this thing is just, it's, it's something that I've never seen a shed off a deer of this caliber in my life. And it's only a two and a half year old deer. Um, you know, it's at two and a half, it's probably pushing 135, 140, which in Pennsylvania is not a bad deer for that age. You know, it's, it's, it's respectable, I think anywhere, but especially here, it was really, it was really something, to, you know, to us and, me and my dad both have a thing for brow tines. I don't know what it is. Like you can show me a 160 inch deer with no brow tines. And I'm like, well, it's a nice deer, but it doesn't have any brow tines, you know, or you can show me 120 inch deer with 10 inch brow tines. I'm like, wow, look at those brow tines. You know, I don't know why that is, but that's just something with me. I, I love brow tines and I've shot deer because they've had nice brow tines, whether or not they have good tops. I just, there's something about that, you know, that goes, Hand, maybe it's because of this deer, honestly. I don't know. But so the, in 2009, we found the right half of the deer, never found the left half. And we, we looked a lot. I mean, we, we shed hunt. We're pretty big into shed hunting. And we, we never found the other half of this deer. So the whole 2009 summer goes by and we never have it on camera. We, we can't figure out where this deer's living. We have no idea where he's at. Um, but we didn't focus a lot of time. I mean, we, we hunted him pretty hard, but we weren't like, we got to kill him this year because we think he's going to get bigger. But of course being he's on public land, which I, I guess I've kind of forgot to mention, but this deer was on public land, which anybody can hunt. So, I mean, we don't focus deer so much like you guys do out there because it's hard for us to quote unquote name a deer and then have that deer on our farm or whatever every year, because uh, a lot of time our food changes and when the food changes, the deer might go a mile or two different directions just because they have to survive. They're going to go where the food's at. Whereas, you know, a lot of times in ag fields and stuff like that, there's there's going to be food every year in the ag field. And there's going to be a shelter where that deer feels safe every year in a similar place, you know. But so we don't really have that. So we hunted the deer kind of hard in 2009. Um, I don't know. We put a lot of hours into them, but we never saw them. We never had them, never had trail cam picture of them, never saw them in person. So we didn't even know if he was alive come the next, this you know, next season or not. We didn't know, you know, probably someone shot him with a rifle or in, with bow season or something. Um, so in, in 2010, we were shed hunting the same area, which is a, a bottom. And we found his right hand side again, underneath the same exact hemlock tree that we found his right side under the year before. And, when, when you see, when I'll show you guys a picture of these sheds later. I'll, I'll send you a picture. Um, but there's no doubt it's the same deer. I mean, the brow tine has the same curve, is the same length. Uh, he's just a mainframe eight point, and he has a kicker point coming off his uh, his base. It's like an inch long, maybe. And uh, the second year, the kicker point off his base is probably an inch long versus a half an inch the year before. But he's just he's gone from a two and a half to like a three and a half year old deer. He's getting good mass, but he's still almost the same exact frame as what he was the year before, you know, probably 18 inches wide with like nine, 10 inch G2, eight or nine inch G3, just, just a good solid deer. And, uh, so 2010, same thing as 2009. We literally spend, I don't know, hundreds of hours hunting this deer trail cameras, never get a picture of him on trail camera never see him, nothing. So basically 2011 rolls around and it's like, well, here comes, you know, 2011 shed season. Let's, let's go back in there, see if we can find this buck again. Maybe, maybe he made it. We we've never seen him. So hopefully he did. Uh, so 2011, we find his right side again in the same area, probably 50 to a hundred yards from where he found his previous sheds, but we never found his left-hand side. We could only ever find his right-hand side which is completely, I don't, blows my mind to think about it, that you can't find a deer of this caliber. You, you can't find both sides of them. You can only find one side. And you're finding the same side literally in the same place three years in a row, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, so in 2011, he's now a four-and-a-half-year-old deer, and he's he's probably pushing 150, maybe one maybe mid-150s. Um, just It just 
completely he's a stud i mean there's no what no other way to say it that he's just a complete stud of a deer and now his on his base instead of having one kicker point he has two kicker points and i think the one was like an inch long and the other one's like an inch and a half long or something probably both scorable but they're more just junk than they are anything but yet again you could tell it's the same deer same shed you know the same curved brow tine same kicker points on the base so we hunted him again in 2011 never saw him never had him on trail camera never i mean like we we, we actually know some people that hunt in this in a similar area we talked to them and they had no idea this deer even existed you know we were like hey have you guys ever seen this deer and they're like um, no i mean you know they show us trail cam pictures and he was definitely not a deer that they had on trail camera so it's like well it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing because the deer is obviously somewhere that we can't find it for a reason but there's probably the reason that deer's still alive because nobody else can find it either you know he's he's starting to he's he's getting old and he's starting to get smart so and like i said 2011 nothing the deer is yet again is a ghost to us um so 2012 we head back in the same bottom we always shed hunt and we, we couldn't find nothing we couldn't find his left side we couldn't find his right side we we couldn't hunt. i mean there's no information that this deer was still alive um but we still hunted him all year like we had the previous years because we had faith that he had you know we, we think he's alive because of uh you know, just just where he was at, he was he's in a hard place to hunt. That I don't think your average hunter is going to get in there to hunt him just because you have to walk to it, and it is a difficult place to hunt. And if I think it's difficult, most people probably think it's impossible to get there, type of thing. You know, so 2012, we hunt him. Like I said, we hunt him real hard. Never have a hide or hair of him. No trail cam pictures, nothing. 2013 he comes along, and do the same thing. Shed hunt the same bottom nothing we don't find either half of them again so it's like well I, we we hope he's alive but now it's been two years since we found a shed off this deer so we don't really know it's at this point you're kind of a guessing game like is he alive he's a public land deer a lot of guys that hunt this area hunt from you know pittsburgh to come up for the weekend they might come up and hunt shoot this deer go home you're never going to hear about them so it by this point we're kind of discouraged that we think this deer is dead um which is so this is what one two three four this is the fifth year we've hunted this deer and we've still never had a trocan picture of them we've found three of the sheds and we've hunted for five years and we've never actually seen the deer on camera or in person or nothing we just we had the physical evidence of a shed that's it so 2014 comes along basically the same story as 2013 shed hunt the bottom nothing can't find a shed we hunt all 2014. Um, no, we can't. We can't get him on trail camera. We can't. We never saw him. Sa- same exact scenario. So, we find this shed three years in a row, and then the, the following three years, we've never even seen the deer. Which, at this point, we think he's dead. You know, it's it's like there's no way this deer because now he's going to be a six and a half year old deer, seven and a half year old deer. He, he's he's got to be dead. There's there's no way this deer's lived this long, and we can't find him. And when, when I'm talking about hunting him year round, we literally would shed hunt that area in the areas around that area. And I mean, I'm talking like a several mile radius of that. We would just comb and we could not find his sheds. We ran a couple dozen trail cameras in these areas every year and could never get him on trail camera. And it, it, it gets frustrating after a while if you're hunting a deer for this long and you've never even got him on trail camera which tells you you're not where the deer is at, obviously. Um, but we, maybe he's dead, too. So, I mean, all these years are going by, and you kind of almost forget about him. You, you never quite forget about him, but you kind of do to an extent because you kind of think it's like, well, that's kind of a lost cause, or maybe he's, you know, that deer, he's probably dead. So we, we kind of put him on the back burner, but we still hunt that area because there's always good bucks there, so we just kind of, we keep riding it out. So in 2015, probably late July, um, we're, we're still running trail cameras in the same area. 2015, we never found, we did not find either shed. So similar 
story in 2015 as in 2014, you know, with springtime, we shed hunt, never found his sheds. Um, so like I said, at this point, he's eight and a half year old deer. We're like, this guy's dead. There's, there's no way this deer is still alive. So we've literally written this deer off as he's, he's dead. There's a hundred percent chance that he's, a, he's dead. You know, there's no chance that he's alive. And, uh, so probably late July, um, the way that the topography is, there's a trick bottom that we hunt a lot. And then you you got fairly big hills on both sides. Um, I'm not sure what the elevation change is, you know, a couple hundred feet elevation change, not huge hills, but fairly decent hills. And on the one hillside, there's a pretty good clear cut up on top of the hill. Um, so we have been hunting this clear cut fairly hard for the last five years because we think this deer might be living in this clear cut, but going down this bottom the winter, you know, or like the winter in the bottom, because you, you know, you get snow and stuff, it pushes them down low sometimes. So we're, we're, we're thinking this deer might be in this clear cut, but we've hunted this clear, clear cut for the last five years. And, uh, we've not seen them. We've not nothing, you know, so it's kind of a guess, but, from looking at maps for hours upon hours upon hours, this is the best estimated estimated guess that we can kind of come to that this is where this deer has to be if he's still around. Um, so we put a we put a trail camera on a skid trail in the middle of a clear cut. On there's there's no trees. You can't go up a tree in a tree stand or nothing. So, but we found like a little dead snub or a dead snag that we put a trail camera on, on this old skid trail. And the skid, the, the skid trail is kind of like a three-way intersection right there. So there's three different directions that we thought, well, maybe deer will travel any way on this, on the skid trail. And, you know, well, it's probably a good spot for deer movement. You know, maybe, maybe there's some good bucks in here because we're kind of still looking for this deer, but at the same time, we're kind of forgot about this deer. Um, so we put the stroke camera in here and I think the first, it was the first tr- pull. Um, my, my dad sends me a picture on my phone and he says, Hey, I got this, uh, this buck on camera. That's got three beams. It's, it's, you know, it's got a triple main or triple beam. And I'm like, Oh, that's pretty sweet. So, you know, he sends me the picture on my phone and I look at it. I'm like, Oh, that's a pretty sweet deer. You know, it's probably pushing 150. And I'm like, we need to, we need to get on this deer. We need to hunt it. And he's like, I agree. He's like, the only problem is, is like, it's in the middle of a clear cut. How do you hunt it? And uh, we have basically been uh, tree stand hunters forever. Like I grew up being a tree stand hunter. And that's how my dad grew up as well. And uh, so we didn't know how to hunt this deer because we're, we had him on the camera where there's nowhere to hunt, but it's like, hey, it's a triple beam buck. I've never seen one before. Let's hunt him. That's, that's a cool thing. Like, if we can shoot him, we're going to forget about these other bucks that we haven't been able to find on trail camera for the last five years. So let's, let's hunt this deer. You know, he's he's a good deer. Uh, so anyways, like I, I told you guys earlier, I'm a forester. And a lot of days I sit in my truck and I eat lunch, you know, by myself. So I'll sit there and, for you know, a lot, a lot of times I don't have service on my phone. So I'll sit there and I'll look through my my gallery on my phone just to look through old, old photos of deer and trail cam photos and stuff. And, you know, like my, my mind never shuts down on deer. You know, if you ask my wife, there's three seasons and that's uh, hunting season, shed season and trail cam season. <laughs> so that's that's literally my brain is 24 seven as I'm thinking about deer. And uh, so I'm looking at my phone at this this triple beam buck that my dad sent me. And I'm like, man, this thing's a stud. And. I zoomed in on it, and when I zoomed in, I noticed that he had kickers off both bases of his antlers that were, like, four inches long. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting because that buck that we had on camera, or we never had on camera, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that brow time buck that we had on camera had, or not, yeah, sorry, we had the shed off of, I keep saying camera, but uh, the brow time buck that we had the shed off of had a kicker on the base, and I'm like, nah, there's no way. It can't be the same deer. It's probably just a genetic or something in that area that has, I mean, you guys know there's a lot of deer that have kickers on the bases of them. And so I, I zoomed in on the picture. And I'm like, well, it's definitely got kickers on both bases. And then I start looking at the picture closely. 
And what my dad thought was the third beam was actually the brow tine. And as soon as I see this picture, I'm like geeking out. I'm, you know, I'm sitting in my truck and I'm like, holy shit, you know, this, I just, I just found this, this, this is like the biggest piece of a puzzle that you could literally find. And it was right in front of us the whole time. And we just, we, we, we were overlooking it because we thought it was a different deer. Um, so I, that, that night on my way home, well, actually, I guess I did live at home. So with my parents then, so like, I, I, I got home and I'm like, dad, I'm like, I need to tell you something. He's like, what, you know, or he, he had, had no idea what I was, what I was going to tell him. And I was like, that, that buck that you have on camera, I'm like, that's not a third beam. He's like, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, I looked at that photo. He's like, it's gotta be. He's like, what else is it? And I'm like, seriously, he's like, I'm like, look at that photo again. He's like, okay. So he pulls it up on the, on the laptop there and looks at it. And he's like, it's gotta be a third beam. What else could it be? And I'm like, no, I'm like, look at that photo again. And he's like, looking at it, looking at it. He's like, it's gotta be a third beam. What else could it be? I'm like, it's, <laughs> it's a, I'm like, that is a brow tine. I'm like, don't you know, I'm like, and he's like, holy shit, that's a brow tine. He's like, that's that deer. So we, we've been hunting this deer since 2009 and did not get him on trail camera until, until 2015, which is crazy. Cause like I said, we ran trail cameras every year for this deer for, I mean, I'm talking two dozen trail cameras in this area and had never got this buck on trail camera. So it goes from thinking that deer's dead to like, holy shit, he's alive. We have a chance of killing him. And, uh, but we still had in our, in our mind that year that we have to hunt out of a tree stand to kill this deer, which looking back on it was a, was a really dumb idea. But we hung a tree stand a hundred yards away from where, where we had this buck and camera. And, uh, all summer long, he was there probably almost every day, every other day. Um, and he's just browsing on briars in the clear cut. It's always doing, you know, it's real methodical, moves super slow, just has nowhere to be, no concerns in the world. Just, you know, he's just out living his life, eating, bri- eating briars and chilling basically. And uh, so we hunted him 2015 and basically around hunting season time when he became hard horned, he, we, we lost him on trail camera and uh, never saw him. So 2015 was kind of a, kind of a bogus year because we got, got super hyped. We finally got this buck on camera. We we're like, Oh, this is the year we're going to kill him. We, we know he's still alive. You know, at, at this point he's at least eight and a half, if not nine and a half. And he's actually gotten smaller since um, he's probably still close to 150, but he's definitely gotten smaller since what he had to have been when he was six and a half or five and a half. You know, I don't know what he was it, those years because we never found his sheds. We never had him on camera. But uh, so 2016 comes around. Similar story. We still can't find a shed. We look and look and look, can't find a sheds. But this year, I'm like, hey, we had him on camera last year at this exact spot. So we're going to put a trail camera in here because I think this deer is living right here. Um, and a good example that a lot of guys talk about is as a deer gets older, their home range shrinks. And this deer is literally the perfect example of this because this is the reason we couldn't find a shed. This is the reason we couldn't find him. We couldn't get him on trail camera because he was confined to this clear cut. He, he had shelter, he had food, and he did not have to leave it. You know, so we didn't know this at the time, but that's after hunting a deer for six years, this is what you find out. And uh, so 2015 or 2016, uh, the trail camera, same tree. He's there like clockwork. I mean, every day of the summertime and it's all daytime. Very rarely was he there at nighttime. It was mostly daytime photos of him. And uh, I, I don't know how we have thousands of photos of him that summer. I mean, just every day. It's it's almost like you get tired of looking at this deer, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but we almost got tired of looking at him on trail camera because you, you'd pull your trail camera and he was the only deer on the trail camera. It was like it was either him or there was nothing there. And uh, so there's not a lot of deer in the, in this area. Just, just so you guys know this, it's, it's not a place where you're going to go and see 10 deer in the evening. It's a place you're going to go and maybe see a couple deer a year, like even in hunting season, just, be, just because there's not a lot of deer there, but the right deer is there. So that's why we, we hunted it. Um, but in 2016, we thought about it a lot. And this is where my part comes into this, this, uh, this whole story it's probably the biggest part I play in this is, you know, my dad's a good hunter. He's a smart hunter. 
he knows every piece of land within a 20 mile radius of his house. Like he he can tell you where this happened 20 years ago underneath this log, yada, yada, yada. He, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's his knowledge of the woods is incredible. Um, but he, his thinking is old school because he grew up in a different time than I did for, for fun. I sit at my computer and I watch YouTube videos on hunting and I, I literally will pick apart people's hunts on YouTube to learn from their mistakes and like, Oh, these guys did this. It worked for them. This might work for me. Whereas my dad's like, Oh, this, this is the spot to hunt. I've been hunting here for 15 years and it's a good spot type of mentality, you know, which is obviously worked because he's killed more 140 inch deer than I've killed in my life. But that's it. <laughs> we won't go into that right now. Yeah. But, uh, so I'm like, I got an idea. I know how to kill this deer. And he's like, well, what, what are you thinking? He's like, oh, right now at this point, he's like, I'm up for anything. Because my my dad was literally getting up in the middle of the night. He would get up at midnight or one o'clock and he could not sleep because he was thinking about this deer. And he would go downstairs, turn his laptop on and look at trail cam photos of this deer. Like this is how this is how obsessed he's getting with this deer. And uh, so he's like, whatever you think, he's like, we're not out nothing. We'll, we'll do I'll do whatever you think we can need to do to kill this deer. And I'm like, OK, I'm like. This is the only spot we've ever seen this deer on trail camera, correct? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, we need to hunt right here. And he's like, well, how do you suppose we do that? Because there's, there's no trees here. We're in the middle of a clear cut. And I'm like, you have a ground blind, right? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, ground blind right here. I'm like, we'll kill this deer this year. And he's like, eh, I don't know about that type of thing. Because we both hate ground blinds because you can't see out of them and you can't hear out of them, and I just, you, you feel like you're confined, you, I don't know, I just, they're deadly, don't get me wrong, but there's something about hunting out of a tree stand when you can see 100 yards in the woods, and it's, it's just, it's magical, honestly, um, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, ground blinds are, we, we hunt out of them, but man, you just lose so much, you're like, there's like another element in between you and the, the wilderness, and you can't hear, and like you said, you can't see, and you just miss out on, especially if you're hunting in like a big blind, like the wagon blind this year, man. That thing's so <laughs> big, like you have to have two people in it to cover like all the angles and you just miss out on so much. So we're tree stand hunters all the yep. way. Well, and so are we, but I, I convinced them that we need to hunt right here in the ground blind. And he, he thought that that was a good idea. So in Pennsylvania on public land, you can't trim anything. So putting a tree putting a, a ground blind in is a challenge when you're in the middle of a clear cut because you cannot trim you're not allowed to trim anything and we like to try to be as legit as possible we, do, we don't do anything illegal so we literally put the blind in the woods without cutting anything so he had a shooting lane to the left and a shooting lane to the right that was like shooting through a basketball size opening basically and he could shoot two spots on the skid trail and that was it. And I'm like, if this deer comes down this good trail, he's going to be 10, 15 yards. It's going to be a chip shot. You know, this is, this is as easy as it gets. If, if the deer reads the script, all you got to do is shoot him basically, which I know is a lot easier said than done, but in in my mind, it sounded good at the time. So, um, uh, we, we watched this deer all summer. And then when he got hard horned, he kind of disappeared again. Same, similar thing to what he did last year, but he was still there once in a while. Just and it was, he was there in the daytime, hard horned, but not every day. It was sporadic. Um, so probably about well in Pennsylvania too, you can't put your stand or your blind out. It has to be within two weeks of the opening of season. So you can't put a blind out a month before season because that's illegal. It has to be within two weeks of hunting season when you put your stuff out, which is pain in the butt. Uh, but so we, we did that with two weeks before season, we went out, we put the blind up, got it ready. It's like, all right, this is, this is where it's going to happen. You know, first morning of season, this is the place to be. So I told my dad, I'm like, we know the deer's here. We know he's using this trail. Let's not come in. Let's not check it. Let's, let's leave it sit for the next two weeks. And the less ground scent we have in here, the less, you know, commotion we make, the better chance of killing this deer in my opinion, that's, that's the best chance we have is don't come in here until we want to hunt it, you know? And he's like, well, I'm, I want to check the camera. I want to see if he's there. I'm like, 
if he's there, he's going to be there. Basically, that, that's my thinking on it. If if you go in there and check your camera and he's there, he might not be there next time because he might catch on to you. So I'm like, we we can't go in. We got to stay out. We, we this, this is trust me. I'm like, if we can stay out of there for two weeks, I think our chance of killing that deer is going to go up, you know, dramatically. And he didn't want to hear that. He was firmly against that. But I I basically said this is how it's going to be, and he was like, okay, I'll listen to you this time, even though. I'm a, I'm a little punk kid and I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> he, uh, so the first day of, uh, deer season, I actually hunted down on a piece of my father-in-law's property down by my house down here. Cause I had like 140 inch deer on pro uh, on camera down here that I was kind of, I wasn't really focusing on, but he was in the area. So I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to sit here and hunt this deer because he's, he's a respectable deer. And, uh, my dad's like, well, I'm definitely hunting that blind, which I kind of knew because at this point, my dad had found the sheds three years in a row off this deer. Uh, he has put in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours on the deer, looking at maps. I mean, he's he's literally obsessed with this deer at this point. And it's not that I'm not that way, but I, at this point, I kind of think it's his deer. I, I don't, I don't, I know technically no deer is anybody's deer. But at this point in my mind, I want my dad to shoot the deer because I know how much it would mean to him to shoot the deer. And that's uh, so like, I mean, growing up, my dad's done everything for me because he wants to see me succeed and he wants to see me shoot the animal or shoot the buck or whatever. But I'm like, you know, at this time, I think it needs to be different. I think my dad needs to shoot this buck. So I'm like, you know, you need to hunt the blind the first day, which he does, which uh, kind of is an interesting twist to the story because I'm sitting in my ground blind, which I hunted out of a ground blind too the first day, which is odd for me. And he hunted, he's hunting out of his ground blind, which was a first for both of us because it was the first time we both ever hunted out of a ground blind. It was both the same day in two different places. And probably 25 minutes before daylight, I get a text from my dad, and he's like, I'm screwed. He's like, my season's over. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, did you like fall and break your arm or like, I'm like in my mind that goes to that because he's 56 years old and he says my season's over. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And he's like, I'm screwed. Like he's pissed. Like he's like, I'm screwed and all this stuff. And he won't tell me what's wrong. He just keeps saying I'm screwed. I'm like, what? Well, tell me what's wrong. I, I, you know, like the suspense is. So I actually called him the first Saturday archer season at daylight. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like what, you know? And he's like, they TSI this entire clear cut, which I don't know if you guys know what TSI is, if you're familiar with that term or not. Yeah. Um, but so they literally cut the entire clear cut of everything except the briars. So it's wide open except for three, three foot briars in the entire clear cut. I mean, you can see 200 yards in the clear cut. And he's like, this is, I'm, he's like, this is screwed. He's like, this deer's probably gone. He's like, all these guys literally cut down thousands of trees in the last week they did this when we weren't checking our trail camera that's why we didn't know about it till the first day of season um and so pretty much when, when we did check our trail camera all we had was a thousand pictures of guys with chainsaws cutting down brush <laughs> but you know it i told him i'm like hey that deer's been living there for the, the past how many years maybe he's still gonna stay there you know as long as he's got briars maybe there's enough cover for him to stay at at this point what else do you say you know, I kind of, both of us, I think we're kind of heartbroken and, uh, but kind of nothing, nothing you can do about it. So you just make the best of it. And, uh, anyways, hunted, he hunted that day and didn't see nothing. Um, now this fall, it was the fall of 2016. I got married in May of 2016. Um, and I was actually going on an elk hunt in late October, um, which my wife was okay with, which is, which is rare. But so I didn't actually go, I didn't, I didn't go on a honeymoon that year. We, I went elk hunting that year. So, but, uh, my dad hunts that, uh, the blind doesn't see a deer. And, uh, I think we're leaving like the 19th. I think it's a Friday night or Friday morning. We're leaving to go to Colorado, which is going to mess up our deer season. And all I keep hearing my dad say is I don't want to go to Colorado because I want to kill this deer. And he's like, if I'm in Colorado, I'm going to be thinking about this deer. And I'm like, hey, 
we're, you know, don't look at it that way. We got to look, you got to enjoy your trip. Don't, don't be thinking about this deer. And he's like, I can't, I, he's like, I, this is all I think about is this deer. And I'm like, I, I mean, what do you say to the guy? You, you try to like, you know, talk to him and like, Hey, like if we don't kill him, it is what it is. Let's, let's just make the best of it. But he was just, he was still wrapped up in the deer that I, I didn't know what to say to him, you know? So he hunts the blind probably four or five nights is never seen a deer out of it. So it's probably getting to be about the 10th of October. Now he's hunted the same, you know, half a dozen times, still never seen a deer. Um, he actually walked up on a decent eight point one night when he's walking into his, into the blind and it was like 30 yards and he could have shot it, but it was like a 17 inch eight point, you know, he, he wasn't going to shoot it that early in the season. And, uh, especially knowing that that deer was there, he wasn't going to shoot that deer. Um, so it's the week before we're, we're it's a uh, Friday night and it's one week until we go to Colorado. And my dad's still kind of bummed out. He's like, I don't, I really don't want to go to Colorado and you know, I'm going to ruin my whole season. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, we'll just, let's, Hey, like we still got it. We got a week of season left before we go to Colorado. Let's, let's hit it. You know, um, so Saturday morning, we hunted a different spot on Saturday morning, which was October the 15th and, uh, didn't see much of anything, maybe a couple little bucks, a couple deer, nothing special. And we're, we're talking about that. Like, okay, this is, this is literally the last night we have to hunt before we go to Colorado because he was actually at the time working with me. So his, his evenings were hit or miss. Like he, he might get out in an evening, but more than likely probably wasn't going to because we had, we had to pack and make sure we had everything ready our gun sighted in and all that stuff. So it's so October 15th. It's like 75 degrees, bluebird, sunny day, Saturday, you know, there's a bunch of guys in the woods because the archery season's in and there's all these guys up hunting and stuff. It's, it's a beautiful day. So everyone wants to be in the woods, even though it's a terrible day to be in the woods. Um, it's like, you know what, let's, let's try this year one more time. Let's, let's both go in there and uh let's hunt this see what happens you know probably not gonna see nothing because we haven't seen a deer out of the blind all year but hey let's let's give it let's give it a whirl and uh we actually we ended up hanging another stand i guess bring it back a little bit we ended up hanging another tree stand about 250 yards from the blind and my dad had hunted that several different evenings and he had seen some decent bucks but he never saw the buck he wanted um so that night when we're walking in to the, the blind one of us is going to hunt the blind one of us is going to hunt the stand and we come to a Y in the road and he's like okay which one are you going which one do you want to hunt and i'm like well i kind of in my, in my mind this is what i'm thinking i want to hunt the tree stand because you've been seeing deer there and you haven't seen a, a, a single deer out of your ground blind yet this year so why the hell do i want to hunt that but so in, you know of course i say oh i'm gonna hunt the tree stand because that's where he's been seeing deer at. So I guess being greedy or whatever you want to call it, I'm, I'm going to go hunt the tree stand. So he's like, well, that's fine. He's like, I'll go sit in the blind. He's like, I probably won't see nothing, but I'll go, I'll go sit there. So go, I go up and, you know, climb up in the tree stand. I'm sitting there and, you know, it's like I said, it's like 70 degrees in October, mid October. It's warm bluebirds, you know, bluebird day, not expecting to really see much of anything. And I didn't, I never saw a deer that night. But uh, about probably 10 minutes before legal shooting light was over, I get a text from my dad and he's like, I got him. I shot him. I'm like, what? Like, like, are you shit? Are you, what are you like? Are you shitting me right now? Or what? what's going on? Like, don't like, you know, I don't know if you're pulling a prank on me. I don't know what, you know, and he's like, no, he's like, I, sh I, and then the text message stops. And it's like, that's all it said was like, no. And like a bunch of jambled up messages. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? What What is this? You know? So I'm like texting back. I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? And he's not replying. I'm like, so he calls me and I knew when he called me, something was seriously, something was happening because he doesn't normally talk unless it's something pretty important. And he's like, I got him. He's like, I, I think I got him. And I'm like, got what? He got, and he's like, the brow time buck. And I'm like, oh, no, like, no way. No shit. This is so like, seriously. And he's like, yeah. He's like, I think he's like, I think I shot him in the neck though. I'm like, what what what, <laughs> what 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 you shot him in, in the neck and just a quick backstory on this 
about two years prior in a similar area, my dad actually shot a, a probably the biggest buck he's ever shot at in the woods. He shot it in the neck because his cam hit a limb on a tree. And when his cam hit the limb, it, you know, it kind of threw a shot off. He, and he shot the buck through the neck. We tracked it for like two miles and just ran out of blood and never found the deer. So I think he, I think that deer lived, but we never, we, we never found the dead head. We never found the deer. So we don't know. But um, so when he tells me he shoots it in the neck, the first thing my mind goes to is this deer he shot two years ago. And I'm like, oh man, this isn't good. Like, I hope he's like, like not, I hope he's messing with me, you know? And he's like, come here. You know, he's like, I can't, he, he, he talking to him on the phone He's like, I cannot physically text. He's like, I'm shaking so bad, I cannot text words, which is why the the word the text message said no, blah blah blah, didn't <laughs> didn't say anything, you know. So I, I get on my stand 15 minutes before dark because at this point I didn't really care about any other deer in there except this deer, and I so I get on my stand when it's still daylight and I I walk over to him, and I I get to my dad about uh it's, it's just getting dark. It's still it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. Um, and he's kind of calmed down a little bit, but he's still pretty wound up. Like, I don't think I've ever seen my dad in this like capacity or mental state, you know? And I just, I, he's, he's like a kid at Christmas is what he's like. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, calm down. What happened? I'm like, he's like, well, an hour before dark, he's like, I looked up and, you know, I was sitting there looking back and forth with my binoculars. And he's like, I, I saw some branches. He's like, I don't remember those branches being there. But he's like, oh, you know, it's in a clear cut. They're probably just something I just overlooked. And he said, I'm sitting there with my binoculars looking at these branches. And all of a sudden, he said, the branches moved. And he said, they weren't branches. They were actually, it was antlers of the deer. And the deer's at 30 yards, okay, an hour before, like, probably an hour before legal shooting light. Um, and he, so he said, as soon as he saw the antlers, he's like, I know what deer it is. He's like, but I, all I could see was the antlers. He said, every time I would pick his head up, I could see the antlers above the briars, but I could never see the, see the deer. And so he actually watched the deer for 45 minutes. For in, in, in 45 minutes, the deer went from 30 yards to 20 yards. So in 45 minutes, the deer walked 10 yards. And uh, I don't know if, the, like I said, the video I sent you guys on, on Instagram there, you can kind of see the deer literally just eats briars and stands there. He'll eat a briar, he'll look around, eat a briar, look around. That's what he was doing. He was methodically just chilling. You know, he would eat, eat a little bit of food and he would just look and eat some food and he would look. And, you know, he was, he was an old deer and he was a smart deer. Um, so my dad watches his deer for 45 minutes in bow range the entire time but never had a shot because the briars, he just, he's like, I could literally, he pick his head up and he said, I could see his head and his neck. And as soon as he said, I could see his head and his neck. I'm like, Oh boy, this story is going south real quick. <laughs> you know, cause I figured what happened was he, he waited for 45 minutes and couldn't wait any longer. So he just decided to shoot in the neck or something, you know, it, this is what's going through my mind. And I'm like, I can't believe we literally hunted this deer for seven and a half years and you did something stupid. Like you, you blew your chance because you couldn't wait, you know? And he said, no, he's like, it kept coming. He's like, it was coming right towards me. And he said, it walked out at 20 yards on, on that skid trail. But he said it, it wouldn't turn broadside. He said, it just kept standing there, like looking towards the, the ground blind. And then now I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, so you shot it like right in the neck, like looking at you, like, well, that's a terrible, like, that's a terrible idea. He's like, no, no. He's like, I shot it in the crease of the shoulder. And I'm like, what? He's like, it was facing hard angle towards me. And he's like, I shot it right in the crease of the shoulder and he said my fletchings in my luminoc he's like disappeared when i shot he's like i know i got in the in the chest cavity of this deer and i'm like well that's a different story i'm like i still a terrible idea to shoot a deer at that angle but if your you, if your arrow disappeared at that angle you have to have got something a vital right and i mean i would think you had to at least get one lung on that deer um and he's like well i just he's like i couldn't wait any longer he's like i sat here for 45 minutes and he's like, I didn't know what to do. He's like, I was afraid it was going to get dark and I was going to have to sleep in the, the ground line. He's like, I couldn't leave if that deer was still here. You know, he's like, I literally would have just slept here all night because I, I didn't want to spook it. Um, so at this point, I'm kind of like, well, I mean, 
maybe that was the better option. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I just, I didn't want to see someone, like, I didn't want to see the story get messed up by a bad shot. You know, and you see this happen so many times on a deer that someone makes a bad shot coring to them or, the, and, you know, they hit the shoulder and never find it or whatever. And so this is all going through my, my mind. And it's like, I'm, I'm sure he's doing the same thing, but he had actually told me that when he first saw the deer, that he was super excited. I mean, he's like, when I first saw it, he's like, I was shaking like a tree, you know? And then after watching the deer for 45 minutes, he's like, I was, you know, cool as a cucumber. He's like, I literally was like just shooting a target in the backyard. He said, I, I you know, I, he said, I pulled my bow back. He said, I checked my arrow to make sure my arrow wasn't going to hit the, hit the blind. He's like, I double, I triple checked it. And he's like, I just, you know, I sell my pan. He's like, I, I hit the deer right where I wanted to hit it. So, which is, which is a good thing, I guess, you know? Um, so we walk out to, I don't know where we thought the deer was standing at. And there's a, I mean, there's blood immediately and not a lot, probably, uh, en- enough to get you excited, but it's not enough to get, it still makes you worried kind of, you know, like you, you've tracked deer before. So, you know, when you, you find a blood trail, that's like, oh, this is a dead deer. And sometimes you get a blood trail and you're like, ah, I don't know, this, this, this deer might go for a long ways. It, at this point, I'm leaning towards the more, I think this deer is going to go for a long ways. And uh, so we, he, he's like, I think we should just back out. He's like, I think we should just go home, let the deer lay. And I'm like, well, let, I don't know, like, let's track it. I, I mean, at this, at this point, I'm like amped up because I, I want to see this deer so bad. I, I've never seen the deer visually. I've only ever seen it on trail camera and seen the shed. I'm like, I just want to see it. You know, I, I'm like, it has to be dead. There's no way this deer cannot be dead because there's, it, it has to work. I'm like, this deer has to be dead. And my dad's like, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think it, maybe, maybe we let him go. I'm like, here, I'm like, let's track him for 20 yards. I'm like, if the blood trail starts looking good, I said, let's track him. I said, if not, I said, let's back out. And he's like, eh, okay. So we, we made the deal. I'm like, if it looks good, we're going to go. If not, we're going to back out. So we go like 20 yards on, on the blood, on, on the blood trail. And he's just, he's just throwing blood. I mean, it looks like you take it, took a paint can by the gallon and just throwing it, you know? And it's like, in my dad was actually behind me. I was in the front and I turned around and I'm like, he's gotta be dead. I'm like, there's, he can't, this deer could not sustain this type of blood loss for, there's, there's no way. And, uh, so he's like, well, he's like, I'm starting to feel a little bit better about it now. He's like, you know, I had to have hit something pretty vital for this much blood and it looked, it had bubbles in it. So we thought it was lung blood and we went, I don't know, maybe another 20 yards. The deer only ran 45 yards and fell over and it was, it was laying there. And I mean, I, I just, it's one of those things like in my mind, I can, I can, I can envision how happy my dad was. And I mean, this one of those, like the best hugs in the world where we you're both hitting each other's backs and like, you just like so excited and you're, you're yelling and you, you don't even care if the deer a mile away hears you at this point. Cause you, you have done what you want to do. You've killed the deer you want to kill and nothing else really matters. You know, so, but anyways, the deer ended up, he, he shot the deer in the crease of the neck and the, uh, the arrow came out in the shoulder, like in the crease of the shoulder on the opposite side. So he pretty much double longed it. I mean, it was, it was, it was, honestly, it was a phenomenal shot. It's still, I think it was kind of a stupid idea to shoot it quartering to you that heavy, but I mean, I guess that's whenever you're 56 years old and you killed a lot of deer, you know what you can do, you know, (laughs) so yeah, for sure, man. You've been hunting that long. You know exactly what to do. But, man, it don't get much better than that. Being able to see your dad, that's going to be – that's just so epic, man. Being able to see your dad kill a, a deer that he's been after that long. I know what it feels like to see, like, a buddy kill a deer and how excited they get. But a, a dad killing a deer. Homie, you've you've got to experience yeah. that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you kind of know what's going on. But I, that's something I've never got to experience. But I really hope that's something I get to experience with my kid, you know. It's gonna be so cool when we get the game plan with our kids about, you know, bucks. <laughs> Hopefully, they're way smarter than we are. <laughs> right. They actually know how to kill them, so we get some well, it, backup. And it's uh, the deer now is probably probably a mile from the truck. So we we took some pictures. I can I'll, I'll like I said I'll I'll send you guys some photos of it. But the deer died with his, with his head on a log, 
So like the photos we took literally was exactly how the deer died. And it's, it's just like, you know, like it was, it was just like everything fell together so perfectly and you, you can't express Like you can't express it in words. This is the, this is honestly the reason why I started doing self filming was because of this hunt. Like I, I, I can explain it over and over to you guys, but I can't, you guys can't see it, and I can't. Like, you know what? You guys in your mind probably have a picture of how it went down. And it's probably nothing of actually how it went down, you know. So, uh, but yeah, it was like I said, it literally could not, not have been more perfect. I mean, I, I I was so excited for my dad, and uh, he it was it was at this point I think it was the biggest buck he ever shot. I think it scored like one forty two, um, but he had actually the deer had shrunk quite a bit from uh, the previous years. The shed we have at four and a half is probably 20 or 30 inches bigger than what he was the year we killed him. Um, it, now, the, the the year we killed him, his brow times were both, I think one was like 12 and a quarter, one was 12 and a half. Um, and they were literally needles. The, the end of his brow times were so sharp that, like, if you would poke your skin, you'd draw blood. You know, so I don't think there was too many deer around the area because I think that deer just kept him off. You know, like, he just thought all you had to do is poke him in the sides and they're like, Oh, I'm not going to mess with him. You know? So it was, it, like I said, I, I would have, I would have loved to have shot the deer, but there's no one deserved that deer more than my dad. Um, so that's, that's the biggest reason I wanted to come on the podcast and talk about it is because I know he wouldn't do it. Um, and you see all these stories about deer that guys have watched for two or three years and they finally shoot it. And I'm like, this story is is like all these people's deer, except it's it's. I mean, I, I don't know of many people that have hunted a single deer for seven years, and to hunt a deer for seven years, and for three of those years not even knowing it's alive and still hunting it is a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah, but, super crazy. You know, like with with Mister Freeze with you, is if if that deer if it disappeared for a year, would you still hunt it? You know, you, you you go in the intent, you go in the woods hoping that that deer is still alive, and I guess that's kind of what we did for, you know, the first six years of the story. Yeah, that's you nuts, know? man. If he was gone for a year, I'd be like, "Guys, oh, dead." I'm moving. I would say one year is all you get. Yeah. One year, no picks, no sheds. You're like, "All right, he gone." Mm-hmm. And a lot of guys, they're like, "Oh yeah, I saw this buck. I passed him last year, and I saw him 15 times this year before I finally got a shot." And literally the first time that we ever saw this deer was the time that we killed him story of our and lives I, man <laughs> yeah it's you know it's just it's crazy that something can live i mean i guess it's it's kind of crazy that something can live in the woods that you can't find but the best way that i can always describe it to people is you're going into that deer's house they live there you don't so that deer knows those woods and I mean, they know every tree, they know every log, they they know that like the back of their, I mean, if they had hands, it'd be like the back, back of their, their hoof. <laughs> yeah, the back <laughs> of their hoof, you know. So w- when we go in there, we're that'd be like someone walking into my house and like trying to know my house better than I know my house. It's it's yeah. just kind of it's kind of a, a, a flawed logic, honestly. Um, and what we found out was with this deer the reason we found this shed down in the bottom three years in a row and then nothing else was because that deer had gotten older and had moved up into this clear cut and didn't need to leave the clear cut. So I'm sure his sheds were in that clear cut somewhere. And the guys that cut the brush down might've found well, his old sheds. I, we ne- we don't know. I mean, we never found his sheds after four and a half. So for, you know, five, six, seven, eight, we never found his sheds either side of them. So, you know, they're probably, they might still be in the woods right now for all I know, you know, but it's I, just, just to be able to, to hunt a deer on public for that many years. And, you know, when we, when we shot the deer, we asked a lot of people and nobody had ever seen that deer. We, at, to this day, I still don't know anybody that's ever had that buck on camera. Wow. And that, you know, like, that's that's nuts you yeah, know like super crazy so i don't know if, if he wasn't traveling much it, like even in the rut i don't know if that deer had like if there I, there were some does in the area 
So I don't know if he just would literally just was like, this is my home. This, this, the, the clear cut this deer's in is like 60 acres and it's a 60 acre clear cut. So it's not like I'm talking a five acre clear cut. I'm talking, you know, 60 acres. It's a big piece of property. And I, there's probably enough does in that clear cut that he could never leave. He never had to leave it for, you know, in the rut. So I, I think that's the reason that deer lived is just because he was in a place that was so hard to hunt that I mean, literally, if you tried to drive him out in like rifle season, the deer would just run right around the drivers. You know, he, he just, you can't get him out of there. It's like, you know, trying to hunt, you know, rabbits in a clear cut. It's just, it's hard to do. Yeah, for sure, man. And he, he had so many outlets. And like you said, since it's a clear cut, there wasn't probably anybody in there really deer hunting. You know, if someone was going in there, they were, they weren't thinking that there's going to be a mega buck in there for sure. You know what I mean? And, We've we've noticed that too. Is seems like if a deer has an area, um, some bucks travel a lot and some bucks don't travel at all. It's just kind of different personalities and how they how they do things. But man, that that's an epic story. That long on public, <laughs> you know. And then your dad he found the sheds and to finally finish the deal and you get to be there with him on the track job is super well, badass. We we you know. We're, we're we're big bow hunters, but we're not afraid to pick up a rifle and kill a deer with a rifle either. And I know it's, it was talked about. My dad's like, hey, if this deer, if I have to shoot it with a rifle, I guess I'll have to shoot it with a rifle. But he's like, I, you know, he wanted to shoot with a bow. But, you know, so, some people can get it done with a bow and some people can't. But <laughs> I can't. <you> know. <laughs> yeah. I used but, to be no, able to. <laughs> not anymore. No, I, that, that was, I was poking at you there. Yeah. Teddy, but no, I, no I, I had I, a good it, run and I'm just kind of hanging up now. <laughs> shit. It, it was, it was just, I mean, it, it, like I said, it could have not been a better ending to the story. And, you know, we got, you know, of course my dad got the deer mounted and you still talk to him. If you, if you would talk to him today, there's not a morning that goes by that he doesn't sit down in his chair and look at that deer in the wall and, and think about that deer, you know, and it's like a lot of guys don't, that's just, they, until you've been there and until you experience something like that. And I think, like I said, I think with Mr. Freeze, I think you're right on the same boat with that. I think you guys have actually witnessed that with the deer. It's, it's hard to explain that, you know, like, I, I mean, I don't really, like I said, I don't even know how many, it had to have been thousands of hours we put in on this deer. Cause it, you know, we, we, we shed hunted for, I, I mean, every every spring it wasn't like we went in one day and shed hunted and caught it good. I mean, we were walking hundreds of miles a year looking for his sheds. You know, uh, in the summertime, your 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 you know trail cameras every week, every other week, you run in. It, it's it's just crazy to think about how much time we spent on a an animal and how something like that can really just completely take control of your life. You know, it's. It's, I guess that's why they call it an obsession, not a passion, right? Yep, 100%, man. Just, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't the one that was there to put the put the arrow in him, but I probably would have messed it up and shot him in the neck or something. So. <laughs> that's what I would have done, yeah. <laughs> shot over his back or something, you know. Pe- peened it off his antlers. Yeah. Well, but, man, we appreciate you coming on and telling us that story. That's epic, man. And like I said, you experienced it with your dad and and you know all the history all the shit i can't wait to see the shed pictures yeah and, that's gonna be sick and everything put together so like i said man we appreciate you coming on and giving a voice to pennsylvania and letting a, a definite 100 percent legend of the woods um hide and seek winner of the year right here <laughs> <laughs> I, I i really appreciate you guys having me on like i said and uh i felt like i was kind of rambling there but i don't know if i really said much of anything that was important but you know, it's hopefully someone gets something out of the podcast. Oh, no, it was awesome, man. It was a good story. A lot of detail, so, a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of history. I, I, get, I guess if, if, if I have to tell if my, my one message to anybody would be just don't give up, you know, just even if things don't seem right, just don't give up, you know, you know, that that's my, my message, I guess is just keep trying. It's, you know, if it's, gonna, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, you know? Yep. You never know, man can't give up to the 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 end you know just like homie you know finding a buck he shot you know just don't give up and eventually it may work out eventually it might be shit but at least you tried <laughs> yep yep and if, if you give it your all and you give it 100 percent, and that's all you can do if you don't have to 
I mean, some years you're probably going to eat tag soup, but that's that's the that's the the gist of it. You know, you're not going to be successful every year, and you just have to measure success as as far as if you met your goals for the year, and that's all you can do. I love these legends episodes. This guy had history. A really good. He's a really good storyteller, man. Yeah. He took took over the podcast and ran with it. And he was, you know, he was like, oh, I hope I didn't ramble too. I'm like, no, that's perfect, man. This is, this show is about you coming on and telling your story and that he did that flawless. So awesome that his dad, you know, actually harvested the buck, but he's super passionate about it and super proud of his dad. You can tell. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. So I think that's awesome, man. Just a big shout out for him for reaching out to want to come on. And a big shout out to all the Pennsylvania hunters out there. We know you guys are out there grinding, trying to get done on big deer, just like everywhere else. So this episode is for you. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you are a son, um, call your dad up, see if he wants to go shed hunting or get ready for turkey season or something and try to leave a legacy and white till legacy's out.